All righty, so we're going to go ahead and begin and I will hand this over to Ms. Wendy for our well, welcome. Good evening. good evening, everyone. Welcome. So that's my job is to welcome each and every one of you this evening. It is so good to see each and every one, um, particularly on a Monday at six o'clock, but you are here and that's what's most important. So um, what you're going to hear is a lot of informational educational information so that you are brought up to date with what the uh, criminal, uh, what do we call, Campaign for Criminal um, Justice Transparency. That's our group. And so we have been working really hard uh, on the information that's gonna be presented to you tonight. So we ask that you stay tuned, take notes. You will have an opportunity to ask questions, put in the chat box, but uh, we will try to get to everybody's questions. So again, thank you and welcome. Thank you so very much, Ms. Wendy. So right now we just want to recognize our sponsors for tonight. Our sponsors are Isaac, the Kalamazoo Defender Office, the Metropolitan Kalamazoo Branch of the NAACP, Portage Linking Our Voices, the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation, Kalamazoo. WMU for the Study of Race and Ethnic Relations. And those are our sponsors for tonight. So we just wanna do a few housekeeping things here, you all, just a reminder. We would just ask that everybody, if you are not speaking, if you could please stay on mute while you're not speaking. We also would ask that if you have a question or you would like to make a comment that you first raise your hand or use the raise hand feature in Zoom. We are also asked that only one person speaks at one time. And so that's why we'll use the raise your hand feature. And then also we want to invite you if you have not already to have your name in your Zoom box, but then to also put your affiliation, whatever your affiliation is, whether it's a congregation or organization. And then lastly here, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you should see the words that say live transcript. And if you click on live transcript, you click on it and then click on show transcript, you should be able to see closed captioning. Um, and so I am told that this is about 90% accurate. And so just a heads up about that. But if that is what you would like on your screen, please feel free. We invite you to use the closed captioning. Before we move on, we just wanted to first ask if there were any clergy on our Zoom call. And if there was, would they mind offering a prayer for us tonight? So if there are any clergy in the Zoom room, in the Zoom family space here, and if so, would you mind offering a prayer for us tonight? And I'm clicking the windows here to see. Are there any clergy? Okay. All right, so at this time, we're just going to ask um, for folks to go ahead. We're going to take a moment of silence, whether you are a person of faith or a person of consciousness. Um, we invite you to pray in your own way, um, to meditate in your own way, also even to breathe as we get ready to enter this space. So we're going to go ahead and take a moment of silence. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. I am going to hand this over to Captain now. Thank you and good evening, everyone. This is Stacy Ledbetter from Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation. And I appreciate your grace as I get situated for you here. We, 
at this time would like to share a land and people acknowledgement. We honor and pay our respects to the land on which we stand and its traditional stewards, the Anishinaabe, the Council of the Three Fires, which include the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi, also known as Ottawa, Chippewa, and Potawatomi tribes. We also acknowledge the people of African descent who were forcibly removed from their land and separated from their families through the enslavement Holocaust and pay reverence and respect to them for building this country's infrastructure and economy with no compensation or reparations to date. I also want to acknowledge that today, November 1st begins um, Native American Heritage uh, Awareness Month. And so I will uh, share a link from a, with a proclamation from the White House with you all on that as well. Also sharing with you touchstones, we use these as grounding principles and truth, racial healing and transformation, Kalamazoo, just to cultivate the space, a space of uh, respect and acknowledgement. And so I just want to read these titles, lift them into the atmosphere and ask that we all abide with the exception of one that I'll point out. Be 100% present, extending and presuming welcome. Speak your truth if you choose to share with us this evening. And that's always by invitation with that part. Listen deeply. Not uh, relevant to this space is maintaining confidentiality because we're here to learn and lift and we do want to spread the word with the information tonight. So again, this is for um, in spaces where it's cultivated, where the stories are between the people in the room, but that's not the case in this situation. The next one, no language of the soul is privileged over any other language of the soul. Value feeling as much as knowing. No fixing, no saving, and no advising. Identify assumptions and suspend judgment. Respect and learn from silence. When things get difficult, turn to wonder. Wonder about the places that other person um, has come from in terms of his or her or their experiences. That's about that wonder. And finally, trust the healing process, your own heart and the hearts of others. Thank you. And I'll pass it along to Ashante from Isaac. Sorry, I was trying to unmute my um, screen. So hello, everybody. My name is Ashante Collins. I'm the anti-racism task force intern at Isaac. Um, the purpose of tonight's community meeting is to not only inform you all about the open database resolution, but also to educate everyone within this space, um, as well on this important topic. Um, encouraging the Kalamazoo County Commission to fund an open database so our community can keep track of arrests, cases, and outcomes in the Kalamazoo County court system. Um, this will help our community address disparities and enhance transparency um, within our justice system. Um, and that is pretty much well, that's pretty much the basis of what the um, what we're going to be discussing here tonight. So I will pass this on to um, Vice Mayor Perdue. Thank you, Ashante. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Patrice Griffin, and for the next few hours, I am serving as your vice mayor of the city of Kalamazoo. Um, and so I just wanted to touch base really briefly um, on the importance of being involved and being aware and being active in your local um, your local government and calling in and letting your voices be heard as an elected, I can, I can definitely attest to the importance of the feedback that we get from the community. Although sometimes it may not seem like it, I can definitely tell you that behind those doors, in those rooms, the voices that are lifted up um, on these mm -hmm. calls to advocate for the things that you believe in, absolutely make a difference. And so for this um, very important um, topic, this very important need that's going to tremendously impact our community. Um, I just wanted to let that be known um, and encourage you all um, 
to make sure you lift your voices up. So thank you all for taking your time on this Monday evening. I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Luchara Wallace. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Good evening, everyone. If you'll bear with me for one moment, I'm going to share my screen. And what I'd like to share with you this evening is um, why does data matter? Um, the purpose of my section is to really focus on the importance of collecting data, the importance of transparency, transparency, excuse me, and how it impacts our ability to identify disparities in our criminal justice system. So first, let's think about information and data. At its very core, data tells us what we need to do next. Data exposes inefficiencies and disadvantages, and it reveals truths about our habits and what we might do next. It opens up windows into opportunity while offering a glimpse into the future. Data inspires progress and galvanizes change. That's why this database is so important. We want to know where we need to go. We need to know what we've achieved and where that progress is being made and what our major challenges might be or might continue to remain. Data is not meant to be a negative indictment on anyone, unless it is. So what do we know? What do we want to know? And how do we get that information? So the purpose of the database, of the open database, is to provide greater transparency in the local criminal legal system as people are arrested, charged or released, prosecuted, and subsequently sentenced. So you might be wondering, what will this databa database measure? The open database would be publicly queried so that it would allow us to be able to sort information such as um, the date that there, there was an occurrence, the type of alleged offense, the ultimate conviction. We could even trace the race, gender, location, the length of sentences. Was it a plea or was it a trial? Was the case ultimately dismissed? And any other characteristics of interest to the general public? That's all of us. So why is this important? Well, what we find is that by publishing structured standardized data in machine readable format, so meaning that you can search it on your computer, it creates opportunities for us to gather information from different resources or from different sources and combine them to create a picture. And it shows us new and unexpected ways for us to be able to browse and interpret and draw attention to any trends that we see or potentially issues that might occur with greater efficiency. So in Kalamazoo County, we're seeking to encourage the local community to develop applications and tools to collect, organize, and share public data in new and innovative ways. So you might ask, how would this open database actually work? Well, the open database would be a searchable database accessible to the general public. The benefit of this open database is that it's something that you and I, as just general members of the public, we can access this information without a special FOIA request. FOIA is the Freedom of Information Act. And so without us having to go through that process to say, hi, can I please get that information? We would have it at our fingertips. This database would also enable citizens to access, visualize, and analyze public information. So we're not talking about probing into per people's personal information that's not already publicly available. And so finally, the database would only provide information that is common to the public record that would actually be included. So any information that would clearly be determined as an unwarranted invasion of a person's privacy would not be included in this particular database. What are the benefits? Well, there are four benefits that I want to um, share with you, and then I'll conclude my remarks. The four benefits are, number one, the open database will allow the public, that's you and me, to see the details of local cases throughout the criminal legal system. And it will allow us to foster a culture of openness that will increase the momentum behind our Kalamazoo County's effort for, for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. So this data, 
will finally put all of us on a factual common ground so that there's no more speculation about we about what we think we're doing or what we think we're already doing. We can actually look at it from a very um, analytical perspective and actually see what are we really doing. Number three, the adoption of a publicly accessible open database improves transparency. It provides access to public information. And it also improves coordination and efficiencies among agencies and partner organizations across the public, nonprofit, and private sectors. As many of you are a part of the, um, on the call currently, you're involved in various public, nonprofit, and private sectors that frequently are working together to support individuals. And this is one way that we could provide increased efficiency in that support. And finally, one of the benefits would be that most reforms will be better informed because our criminal justice performance will not be speculative. It will become a shared community fact. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any additional it, a desire any information about our sources, I have those available. And this particular PowerPoint will be available to you at the conclusion of tonight's session. I now would like to turn this over to Attorney Joss Hilgard. Thanks, Dr. Wallace. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, it's a really exciting moment for our community. Uh, this, this is a community-driven initiative um, that, uh, that is poised for adoption uh, and is really something I think Kalamazoo can be very proud of. Um, this initiative for the database uh, sprung from a public forum organized by Kalamazoo's chapter of All Pact, which is uh, advocates and leaders for police and community trust. Um, that, uh, that public forum uh, was organized uh, around the topic of uh, um, transparency and accountability in the prosecutorial process. Uh, and that was facilitated by me and Prosecutor Jeff Getting. Uh, and our goal, as um, indicated by All Pact, was to query the public and find out what campaign they might want to engage in to create greater uh, accessibility to information and transparency and how that process worked. Uh, and after a vigorous discussion, the overwhelming majority came to the conclusion Let's build this database. This is what we need to know because it was clear from the call, people weren't sure, um, you know, what were people being arrested for? How many people were being prosecuted? Who got deals? Um, how did it break down in gender and race and neighborhood? Um, and, and that they wanna know that as a precursor to any other additional reforms they might seek. Um, and so, uh, our, our charge then was to help uh, facilitate their management of a public campaign. Um, we raised money uh, and obtained a campaign manager, uh, Carlton Mayers, who is an attorney in Chicago. Uh, before that, he helped uh, in Obama's 21st century policing reforms. Uh, he worked for the NAACP's national chapter uh, on police reform and now currently advises localities around the country, police forces, prosecutor's office, commissions um, on how they can institute reforms uh, that are, are various reforms, whatever the locality may be looking for and helping them think through that. Um, and, and so uh, Carlton joined on uh, then uh, through our, our public members, uh, organizations started to join the effort. Um, and some of them are here, Isaac, uh, NAACP, uh, YWCA, um, many, many organizations uh, saw the same thing uh, that the people in that forum did, that this would be an ideal way to improve the conversation and bring clarity. Um, so as part of that campaign, uh, we researched other initiatives across the country, uh, dozens of counties, uh, cities, 
um, around the country uh, since Obama's 21st century policing, which had a data initiative tied to it, um, have been taking advantage of grants around the country to create these kind of databases. Uh, and the one that we're attempting to fashion here in Kalamazoo um, is one of the more sophisticated efforts um, that, that, that's out there, but there are many similar ones. Uh, this is in many ways getting Kalamazoo to catch up to some of the trendsetters in the nation. Um, and we talk to how their tech people, their political people, how did you get this done? How did you uh, write up the resolution? Uh, how did you uh, manage the data? How did you staff it? Um, and so we were able to provide the county commission, who will be the ultimate arbiter, uh, voting on this initiative Wednesday, um, with funding opportunities, grant opportunities, um, private and public, uh, so that it doesn't require taxpayer money from Kalamazoo. There's plenty of uh, uh, foundations and federal funding interested in making things like this become a reality. We also obtained the buy-in from a number of county uh, personnel who were very happy to offer up their time to the commission as well to help them think through how to technically uh, um, figure out the best way to present this data, having themselves already gone through it. Um, so this, this was kind of the origin story of this campaign. Um, it was a very collegial involving uh, dozens of local citizens uh, who were passionate about this subject. Uh, and we're very happy to report uh, that when Carlton presented uh, this project to the commission, um, it, it received uh, an endorsement from the commission. Uh, they were some, some expressing quite a lot of enjoyment about the presentation and the prospects at such a database, um, concluding unanimously to move ahead with the resolution on Wednesday. Um, I believe now uh, we also have a video of our, uh, uh, our experts' presentation uh, uh, to the commission so that you can understand what the commission has heard. Um, and I'll stand back while that gets played. So, Chair Tracy Hall, Vice Chair Tammy Ray, and Board of Commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to allow me to provide testimony today on the open database resolution. My name is Carlton T. Mayers II Esquire, and I am the campaign manager of the open database initiative with the advocates and leaders for police and community trust, also known as all PAC here in Kalamazoo County. So just a bit of background. In August of 2020, all PAC convened a public forum called transparency and accountability in the prosecutorial process. The explicit purpose of this forum was to have the public come up with a campaign that would bring about greater accountability and transparency in the prosecutorial process here in Kalamazoo County. Josh Hilgart from the Public Defender's Office and Jeff Getting from the Office of the Prosecuting Attorney were asked by Gwen Moffitt from the Michigan Department of Civil Rights to facilitate that meeting and they did. In that meeting, the public decided it wanted to wage a campaign to ask the county to produce a database as described in the resolution that I'm presenting on today. From November 2020 through January 2021, some variation of the group that made the decision to campaign for the database met monthly to consider what would be needed to carry it out. The group sought endorsements of the database initiative from local organizations and obtained such endorsements from the following organizations. Outfront Kalamazoo, Chairs of Southwest Michigan, Kalamazoo Community Foundation, Truth, Racial Healing and Transform, ROI, Michigan Immigrant Rights Center, the Center for Transformation, NAACP Metropolitan Kalamazoo Branch, YWCA Kalamazoo, Hope Through Navigation, Griffin Place and other groups. So the group within ALPAC identified the need for a manager. And in April 2021, the group sought funding from the Kalamazoo Community Foundation to hire such a manager. Then in May 2021, the funding was granted and I was selected as the ideal candidate. 
having an appropriate background and having already been engaged in several conversations about various reform efforts in Kalamazoo County. Relatedly, just so that some of you don't know me that well, I know a few of you have met me already. My background includes, I used to run NAACP's National Criminal Justice Reform Program at NAACP's National Office. While in that role, I also uh, co-authored NAACP's Born Suspect Ending Racial Profiling Report, which was published in 2014 and provides information and resources on how to end racial profiling on the state and local level by law enforcement. From there, I transitioned to NAACP Legal Defense Fund as the policy counsel for the policing reform campaign, where I worked with communities across the country on policing reform, including Ferguson, Missouri, and Baltimore, Maryland, on their consent decrees for over two years. I also negotiated, assisted with the negotiation of the Chicago consent decree. And I worked in New York City on the Eric Gardner case, North Charleston, South Carolina on the Walter Scott case. I lobbied on the Hill uh, on behalf of LDF for federal policing reform legislation, some of which has been incorporated into George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And I also worked with the Obama administration on 21st Century Policing Task Force Report recommendations and other President Obama White House initiatives on policing reform while I was at Legal Defense Fund. And then lastly, uh, I worked at Southern Poverty Law Center and I directed their criminal justice reform program for the state of Florida. So with that said, I am here today on behalf of all PAC to express our strong support for the open database resolution. The open database would create a publicly accessible online database containing all arrests within Kalamazoo County, all criminal charges issued by the Office of the Prosecuting Attorney, and all criminal court outcomes. This database can be publicly searched to sort such data by date, type of alleged offense, ultimate conviction, race, gender, location, length of sentence, plea or trial, dismissal, and other characteristics of interest to the public. This database would not include any personally identifiable information. I'm gonna repeat that for emphasis. This database would not include any personally identifiable information. That means no names. Currently, the public has no good information on who is arrested and what they're charged with. For instance, are black and brown people arrested for some crimes at higher rates than white people? If so, how is that reflected in the charges issued by the Office of the Prosecuting Attorney? We don't know, but we should. However, we do know that according to the Kalamazoo's Public Defender's Office, its clients are 40 to 50% black, even though black residents make up only 13% of the county's overall population. Accordingly, the open database would provide greater transparency in the local criminal justice system as people are arrested, charged, or released, prosecuted, and sentenced. It would allow everyone to see the details of local cases throughout the process. Some of the data that would be included is publicly available now through public records requests, but it's not in a format that residents can easily access, and that makes it difficult to review and compare cases. The taxpayers need to know this data so that they can identify challenges and then establish and implement solutions to solve them. This database will allow residents to look at the case data, compare, and evaluate however they see fit. These are Kalamazoo residents' tax dollars supporting the arrest and the prosecution. It is the Kalamazoo residents' right and responsibility as voters and residents of Kalamazoo County to know what is being carried out in their names with their money. Ultimately, this data could show more people of a certain race or another class are being arrested, prosecuted, and convicted at a higher rate, even if they commit crimes at a lower rate. The county should create this database to allow for easier public access to this information. Now, I want to note with you, this is not a novel effort, okay? In fact, President Obama's administration encouraged and supported open data initiatives and locales across the country to bolster confidence and trust in the criminal legal system. For instance, the city of Lincoln, Nebraska created a publicly accessible and searchable database containing information on its law enforcement agencies' activities, such as stops, arrests, uses of force, et cetera, all broken down by race, gender, age, location, et cetera. Additionally, the city of Lincoln created a citizen advisory committee to assist with the creation and operation 
of this open database. The committee consists of citizens, academia, and with a data analysis background, who tasked with providing feedback on the effectiveness of the database and guidance on any necessary changes to the database. Likewise, Cook County State's Attorney's Office in Illinois has a publicly accessible felony dashboard with case level data sets of the intake, initiation, sentencing, and disposition of felonies in Cook County that dates back to 2010, even though it's been in existence for only a couple of years, okay? It's retroactive. This data is broken down by several data sets, such as race, gender, age, location, et cetera. Cook County State's Attorney's Office hired its first ever chief data officer and a state's attorney's office data team. The chief data officer and the state's attorney's office data team are responsible for establishing the case level data sets and annual data reports. They are also responsible for leading the Cook County State's Attorney's Office ongoing effort to increase prosecutorial transparency and innovation in the criminal legal system. The Cook County State's Attorney's Office allows community members to analyze and provide feedback on the published data. They also encourage community members to attend its Hacking for Justice workshop to learn more about the State Attorney's Office data sets and the best tools for analyzing them for free, okay? The production of the Cook County State's Attorney's Felony Dashboard is funded by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation as part of the Safety and Justice Challenge. Now, I want to note with you, I know that Cook, the Kalamazoo County has already partnered with the MacArthur Foundation previously through your sheriff's office. So you already have a direct connection to this funder. Just want to make note of that. Now, the Safety and Justice Challenge provides supports to local leaders representing different cities, counties, and states with unique issues and situations who are focused on addressing the misuse and overuse of jails with smart solutions. The Safety and Justice Challenge involves a five-year, $217 million investment by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, jurisdiction selected through a competitive receive financial and tech support in their efforts to rethink justice systems and implement data-driven strategies to safely reduce jail populations. Involved local leaders are funded to identify the drivers of over-incarceration within their cities, counties, and states, engage a diverse set of community stakeholders to determine ways to address local drivers of over-incarceration, address racial disparities in incarceration, and improve the system as a whole, and build infrastructure to track the right data and measure performance over time. More specifically, these local leaders must develop a model and model effective ways to keep people out of jail who should not be incarcerated and to reintegrate those returning from incarceration back into the community upon release so that they can stay out of jail, right? We want them to stay out. The challenge network sites represent 51 cities and counties across 32 states that are all modeling reform. So in conclusion, Please pass the open database resolution. The taxpaying residents of Kalamazoo County are entitled to this data. To clarify, considering the advice of your corporate counsel, we are not asking you to force the office of the prosecuting attorney and the court system to provide the relevant data for the open database, okay? Rather, we are asking you to commit to creating the database and establishing a budget line item for the Office of the Prosecuting Attorney and the other criminal legal system stakeholders to provide the necessary data, okay? I'm gonna end paraphrase of a statement from the Honorable Chief Circuit Pro Judge Alexander C. Lispy during last week's Northside Alliance meeting in which he talked about the disproportionate number of minority youth involved in the criminal legal system in Kalamazoo County. And he said, this is a paraphrase, okay? We have not kept these related statistics. And this is the first thing that we need to get involved in for public safety. We need to know why they are here, where they came from, and what needs to be done to divert them from the system and change these outcomes. We agree with the Honorable Judge Lipsy's statement and know that the open database would provide this data as well as data on adults in the criminal legal system in Kalamazoo County. So thank you very much for your consideration, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. So that was a compelling outline of uh, 
of why this database matters, why we can do it, and um, and that we would be joining uh, communities around the country by doing so. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out that Carlton didn't mention this resolution also includes, in addition to the creation of the database, uh, the establishment of a citizen oversight and advisory committee that would look at the data at the very minimum on a quarterly basis and have open forums to discuss it so that the data would not only be out there for the public to have, but that our elected officials and our community discussions uh, are, are sure to embrace that data and look at it so that uh, the lessons that might be learned from it don't go unnoticed. Um, I'd also point out one other thing. Um, All Pact uh, initiated the public forum to create this campaign. Um, All Pact didn't oversee the campaign itself. Uh, that became a citizen driven thing as was intended by the All Pact forum. So um, uh, that's the criminal, uh, the campaign for criminal justice transparency um, that executive director. Wendy Field spoke of. Um, just a, a small clarification there that all pact just creates the opportunity for these facilitated meetings. And then from there uh, springs the citizens initiative. Um, uh, I'd add also there were a few questions from the commission that uh, between their own corporate counsel and um, and um, Carlton, they were able to satisfy the commissioners um that the commission had uh, the constitutional uh right in the michigan constitution and the, the authority to create these uh, uh funding streams for the court and the prosecutor's office to to accomplish these tasks um and I, i'll point out one commissioner wondered well we need to focus on on the gun violence that's plaguing kalamazoo maybe that should be our focus instead and uh Carlton very uh, perceptively pointed out that this is exactly how localities are confronting that issue. This is the first step. Uh, he said, through these transparency efforts and databases and data sets, conversations are being created where trust is being built. And that allows uh, law enforcement and community participants to engage in the neighborhoods and with the individuals that are going to provide the most ground and being able to uh, improve that situation. So it, it really does touch on all points. Um, and with that, um, I'll, I think we're, we're ready for any questions that the public may have uh, for any of us regarding this project, the database itself, or, or what it might accomplish. Thank you, Attorney Josh. And so just to let you know, we did place the full link in the chat if you want to watch the full um, presentation with questions as well. And then like Attorney Josh said, um, feel free to use the raise hand feature if you have any questions or comments or you can place them in the chat as well. So we invite you to do that now. Carlton did such a good job that you know no one's got anything to ask. Yes. Yes. I am scrolling through the pages here just to see if I'm missing anyone's. Ah, thank you, Carolyn. Yes, I see your hand, Carolyn. Carolyn, yes, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, one thing that I haven't heard uh, discussed in this is um whether the charges that are brought against a person um, are appropriate, or if the same offense for a white person would end up uh, getting a lesser charge than the same offense for a black person or her other racial minority. I'm okay. not sure how that could be um, put into a database, but that that's an excellent question, Carolyn. And and that same question is what drove 
many of those who, who advocated for this database. It's exactly that, and it should show us trends. So for instance, you can sort by type of charge. So it might be resisting and obstructing when encountering a police officer. And you can look up that charge, and then you can sort the people who were arrested for that by race. And then you could look at the people who ultimately had a charge authorized from the prosecutor's office by race. And then you could even look at who was ultimately convicted of that charge by race. Um, and you can set timelines that you want to look at in the last year, the last two years, the last month. Um, so, so those kinds of questions would start to emerge, um, not because you'd see the individual, you know, say discrimination in a case, you would see trends. Is this system systematically treating people differently? And this database would in fact reveal that. And then that would give us all a chance to pivot and say, hey, you know, we see something going on here. What can we do to address this? What does this mean? What does this say about us? You know, and 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 what we're doing and, and what might be able to help. Thank you so very much, Attorney Josh. We have a question in the chat and it's from Trisha and I'll read it here. Thank you, Trisha. Um, what would be the timeline on when the database could have enough information to produce useful results? So what would be the timeline on, on when the database could have enough information to produce useful results? Anyone that can answer that question for us? I think that's a great question, Tricia. Um, and honestly, it depends. That's the great thing about data, because for us, it look, it, what ultimately depends on is when we start to populate that information into the database. So if we were to say request um, data to be input, say, from the last six months, from the last year, even from the last month, it would allow us to get enough information to begin seeing trends, to begin seeing and analyzing or at least doing some initial analysis of the data. And um, as we continue to accumulate and develop the database, then we would have larger numbers and we would be in a better position to be able to make even more informed um, use of the database. But honestly, as soon as we get access to data, that's when we could start making some, some kind of generalizations or, trend, or at least discovering trends. Thank you so very much, Dr. Wallace. All right, I see Maggie's hand. Maggie, yes. Go ahead and unmute yourself. All right, thank you. Um, I just have a question. Um, I think I, I may have the understanding the answer. So if, if someone is arrested and charged, will it also show us, because I know we get from the prosecuting attorney often, um, there are numbers of, about being you know happy that a lot of folks don't end up in prison, right? So will it also show us those that also are taking pleas? Yes. To avoid uh, prison time? Yeah. Yes, so, so the database, um, and there's one in Cook County that's very similar. They're building an ambitious one, so we're not alone in this. It really takes each of the stages. Uh, so you see the information on arrests. You see the information, then what does the prosecutor authorize? Or the prosecutor often will say, I'm not going to prosecute that case. Um, and I think about a third of the time. Um, and, and then what is the charge they authorize? Is it the same one as the arrest charge? And then what bond is requested? This is also information uh, that is being included in the Cook County one that, that we saw as a, a close analog. Um, and then you look at what is the disposition? Is there a plea offer and what is that? And what is the final plea? And what is the sentence for that plea? Or is there a dismissal uh, because uh, the defendant was able to get the case dismissed for whatever reasons uh, would, would justify that? Um, or did it go to trial? 
And then what was the result of trial and what sentence did the judge impose? So, so all of those things, you can really compare and contrast a, a number of outcomes that I imagine spending just a few hours with this database, uh, anyone in Kalamazoo would, would start to understand the criminal justice system a whole lot better. All right, thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand or place them in the chat. There's a question in the chat, Charlotte. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Ashante. All right, so I'm going to read this. This is from Don Jones. It was mentioned that no names would be revealed. I'm wondering if the names of judges, prosecuting attorneys, police officers would be revealed. So it was mentioned no names would be revealed. I'm wondering if the names of judges, prosecuting attorneys, police officers would be revealed. So I'll, I'll take a swing at that one too. That That is not included in the resolution. So individuals not to be named, it would just be uh, the ultimate resolution and charges um, and all the things that I mentioned sortable by all of the categories we mentioned. Um, that said, I mean, the, the county, it, there are the criteria that are in the resolution and other data that is of interest to the public. If the commissioners decided, I'm not, I, you know, I don't know that, that anyone's advocating for that, but you know they could add other criteria in addition to the ones that are outlined in the resolution uh, when they construct the database, but based on public input. But but that information is not in the resolution. Thank you so much, Attorney Josh. I see another comment um, from Wendy Flora. It says, thanks, every, thanks to everyone who is working on this database. Great job. Thank you, Wendy. I see a hand, yes. So, I, so the name is I-S-A-N-H-O-U. Feel free to say, feel free to introduce yourself of each <laughs> Isabel Sanu. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. You were doing good, though. <laughs> um, I have a question, um, and it's actually related to the answer he just gave. Um, if the name are not the judges, the name of the judges, he said, will not be mentioned. Uh, the attorneys and police officer. I guess my concern is how how do we measure or how would, do we know that even the arrest was done, I would say in the fair way, <laughs> you know, or people might wonder, you know, who was the arresting officer, you know, who was the officer black, white, I mean, is the name like, what we're also trying to alleviate, to fight against. So the judge may not be mentioned. Um, the attorney may, may not be mentioned, but the police officer to me should be mentioned because we should be able to question or wonder what happened and how it happened you know, and maybe get the detail of the arrest, you know, uh, based on what? And if the, this police officer has, has a history, you know, uh, was that, would that be avail available to the public as well? You know, uh, that, I guess that's where my concern is. And, and I understand the confidentiality piece of it. But I think we're doing all this because we're working towards transparency. So I guess I'm a little confused. If somebody can help me with that, please, thank you. That is a great question, Isabel. And um, I think one thing that we want to um, focus on with this particular um, resolution and what we're trying to do to establish the database is we want to look at the systemic impacts and reform and make systemic reform right now. So what happens is um, I think that what we would find is if we notice that there were trends, right? Okay. 
because we because notice in the database we did say you could look at age gender you know race ethnicity location those mm -hmm. kinds of things so there are ways to kind of backtrack to get to that information but that's not what we want to focus on first what okay. we really want to focus on are the systemic issues like number okay. or or maybe they're not systemic issues like maybe we, maybe we got it going on all right okay um, and so, so first we want to focus on identifying systemic areas um, of strengths and needs of improvement. And then if we're finding that there are trends or that out there, there are disturbing occurrences that we're finding, like maybe this, maybe it is around the charges, maybe it is around the arrest, maybe it, you know, like, are there certain elements or parts um, to the system that we're finding or presenting us with challenges, then that's when we might have enough information and data where we can backtrack and say, okay, let's let's look at this more deeply. But we don't want to start there because then we're not looking at the system. We're looking at individuals, and this database is not designed to look at individuals, but really okay. more at the system. I hope that helps. Okay. Oh yeah, tremendously. Thank you. Thank you both so very much. So we have another question in the chat here, and I, it's from Anthony, and I'm going to go ahead and read it. What is the potential to enter false information into the database or miscritical information? And has there been any reports of this in other communities that have been using this already? How will that oversight work? Don't everybody jump off at the, at the same time. Right, well, Attorney, I, you want to go ahead and take that one? And if, if you need I, me. I've been, I've, you know, I'm sure everyone's sick of my voice. Um, uh, um, <clears throat> so the, the way this works, and I can blend it in, I see another question here about um, where does the data come from? Um, so the way this works is the county will be able to, to fund uh, two different uh, other branches of government. This is really neat because we got three branches of government working here. We've got the legislative branch, which is the county commission, which controls the purse and votes on the policies. And you've got the judicial branch, which is already collecting a lot of this data. Uh, it's required to for state and federal purposes. Uh, and then um, you have the prosecutor's office uh, and that's the, and a part of the executive branch. Uh, and that office is getting all the information from the arrest reports. So uh, we have multiple police agencies uh, in Kalamazoo County, uh, you know, Portage City Police, Kalamazoo City Police, County Sheriff, Western Police, uh, Township Police. Um, and so all of that information flows into the prosecutor's office. So there's one office that can uh, kind of capture all that information. And then it's got its own information, who, for whom does it authorize a charge? Uh, what cases does it decide not to pursue? Uh, what charge does it decide to bring? Might be different than the arrest charge. Um, <clears throat> so, so the data would be flowing from the prosecutor's office and the, the court. The court, again, already gathering most of this information um, and the prosecutor's office with access to this information. It's, it's probably not coordinating all of it in a database right now because it gets a lot of police reports, uh, but it would be capable of doing it, but it needs support. Uh, and so that's why the resolution provides uh, funding for personnel or infrastructure that will permit those two branches of government here in Kalamazoo County to obtain and pass the data on. So that kind of asks answers the, the question from Don Jones in the chat. Um, and then uh, to your question, Anthony. Uh, so, so because the courts already collect and, and produce this information as, a, a, as, as part of their procedure, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I can attest to the fact that you know, however that's being conducted, there couldn't be an individual who would erroneously type in something that's not on the sheet they're copying from. Um, and I'm not aware of what their quality control process is. Um, although that data does seem to be 
consistent because it's shared with so many agencies. It happens in public. Um, you know, all of these things are are you know pretty rigorously uh, you know cross referenced in documents, and uh, everything is open to the public. Uh, all the information you can even go in and look up individual cases with the personal information in there. Uh, you can find out someone's name and go look at a court file because our system in the United States permits that. So I have some confidence in that data. <clears throat> and then the prosecutor's office, I mean, that would be run by the, the, the prosecutor of Kalamazoo, the chief law enforcement officer of Kalamazoo. And that position would be directly uh, funded by the county to do specifically that kind of data. Um, again, you know, in, in a hypothetical, um, you know, how that oversight would look and this is something that would be under the control of the prosecutor. Um, but, but it would seem it would, well, it, you know, it would seem to me that that would be improbable and difficult also because that information is verifiable, but um, I, because I'm not a part of either of those offices. Um, I can't probably give you the answer of how that oversight would actually be structured. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Feel free to raise your hand or place them in the chat. And then I see a question from Isabel. Is the group of people working on the database diverse enough to allow transparency and accountability? So is the group of people working on the database diverse enough to allow transparency and accountability? So if I might ask um, a secondary question, um, if, if you're speaking directly about who's a part of the campaign right now, um, then the campaign is not limited to anyone. Everyone on this call is welcome to be a part of the campaign. So the diversity really is based on who is asking to participate. And we welcome everyone here. And if you know others, that are, that are citizens just like us of Kalamazoo County that want to have their voices heard and, and have an influence over this. Um, if you're asking about, um, is the group of people working on the database after it's being, as it's being established diverse enough? Well, then that question, I don't know that I can answer that right now. I don't know that we can all answer that right now because we don't quite know who's going to be placed in those positions at this time to develop the database. However, what we can do is offer recommendations and, um, and, and, and make sure that as the, the group that's organizing this is being developed and brought together, that we are very intentional with whom we place in, in that, uh, that leadership, in that leadership circle. I hope that answers the question. Yes, it does. That's exactly what I was getting at being intentional. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Other questions or comments? All right, I see one in the chat here from Anthony. How easily do we foresee the database can be edited for instance, 60 days in, we realized we've missed something important, some important information that we want. So how easily do we foresee the database can be edited? For instance, 60 days in, we realized we've missed some important info we want. Well, I, I can I can try to tackle that. Part of that is going to be incumbent upon the county. <clears throat> um, if the county makes the commitment to build this database and builds it, um, it'll be a technical question for the county 
uh, although generally adding another uh, field to a database is, is fairly routine. There also be the question is, how easy is that data to get and correlate with the case? I imagine, you know, because each each case outcome would have to be put in, even if the personally identifiable information is not there, um, you know, so there would be a cost associated with that. And the county would have to allocate the costs and, and you know, the, the spending to, to be able to adulterate the database to make that change. Um, so, so that ultimately would be the discretion of the county commission or the county administration. Um, you know, given whatever funds are allocated to 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 be able to do such things, um, and probably would come after community input that hey, we missed this, and we probably want it, or the county itself might say hey, we want to know this, and uh, and then voluntarily do something along those lines. But but I think it's a it, that's a very that question is dependent on how much it cost, how much trouble it would be, and how big of a priority is it for the commission and or the community. Um, and how that's communicated. Um, so it's, I think any, the, the answer is anything is possible, but, but it's, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's probably the best answer I can give. Thank you so much, Attorney Josh. So we have another question here. I don't see a name, but it says iPhone. Is the software already created for this database? That's the first question. And if yes, does it have the capacity to code people's names for future analysis of arrest patterns, et cetera? So is the software already created for this database? And if yes, does it have the capacity to code people's names for the future analysis of arrest patterns, et cetera? Um, I, I'm going to just take this one because I think it's kind of related to the answer I just gave. I'm, so the no is the answer. There have been many databases very similarly created across the U.S. Um, the, the architecture is not particularly challenging, it would appear. Uh, the, the, so, so, um, so it would be very easy to create a, a field for additional data like you know off arresting officer or something along those lines um you know i would echo what dr wallace said um you know the intention of this database is really how do we analyze what we're doing here in kalamazoo um you know what what's happening through the system um i think there are probably superior methods of being able to, you know, ferret out, um, you know, where you have a breakdown in a system through individual misbehavior, um, you know, but, you know, I'm, I'm not making an argument against, against any alternative that you may suggest with your question, but um, that, that this really is a tool for us to to tell us where our system is possibly in need of improvement. And that's an important distinction. Even if, if there, you know, if, if you could do that, it would seem that, that you don't want to mix, you, you don't want to miss the opportunity to be able to look at the system. What is the total outcomes of the system, I think, is, is the consensus of the group. Um, because personnel can change there can be uh, approaches to different personnel, but if the final output is consistently showing certain trends, that tells us maybe it's not a, an individual or something, it's how we do business. And not that there is a, you know, there's someone to, to, to blame for that, but an alternative that then emerges to the way we're doing business uh, that, creates a new opportunity and paradigm for treating uh, the situations that we currently encounter and handle with the, the present system. Um, that's kind of a convoluted answer, I'm sorry. But, so the answer is yes, you, you could easily do that, but then including that data, you know, would count under the same kind of challenges that I mentioned before, how much would that cost? That's a whole lot of extra digging and data pulling from handwritten police reports um, you know, um, 
And, uh, and also it's, you know, we have multiple officers responding. You might not even know exactly what went on. The other comment, you know, sometimes the police reports aren't accurate. Um, once the more you go down in the detail of the individual actions, the less probably clean your data gets for something as broad as this, um, which is something to consider. You don't want to start putting out uh, bad data either. Uh, the information currently that would be taken from police reports uh, are simple things like address, um, time, um, you know, the race and gender of uh, those who are being arrested, um, things that are are uh, the more qualitative observations would not be included in the database. So, um, so again, you know, keeping the data clean. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, Attorney Josh. I have a comment in the chat from Mama Jo, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. And it says, this is just a comment. As we know, in the George Floyd case, as with many others, the police report was very different than what actually happened and what was later revealed in all of the videos surrounding the case. This is very disturbing. Let me scroll down here. Sorry. Uh, and I just lost it. I'm sorry. I can jump in for you, Doc. It says, it continues, this is very disturbing when we think of entering data based on untruths, praying that these are exceptions rather than the rule. Thanks, Captain. Would anybody like to respond to that? Thank you so much, Mama Jo, for lifting that truth. And if not, um, thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Gwendolyn Hooker. I just wanted to, to know that this is one of the reasons why, you know, wearing the video uh, cameras on every officer every time is so important. There's other mechanisms in place to hold um, police officers accountable. Um, we just have to make sure that we are uh, requiring that our officers do that. A lot of times they do it somewhat haphazardly. And so that's when we don't have a recording, we don't have an accurate police report, and then it kind of just unravels. But I think that if Oh, and Gwendolyn, I think it just cut out, just so you know. And then Gwendolyn, were you were you done speaking? If we require folks um, to make sure that they wear those cameras, those body cams at all times while they're on the job, um, that will hold them accountable to be honest. Thank you so much, Gwendolyn. Thank you. Any comments with that? Okay. Oh, Attorney uh, Josh, where are you I, gonna? Mm -hmm. I just say that's a good example of, of the difference. How do you build accountability for a system? How do you build accountability for individual actors? And Gwendolyn Hooker makes an excellent point you know, that that's body cams, dash cams, if they're consistently used, create accountability for individual situations, the database creating accountability for general systems. And, and both are distinct kind of fronts for reform and analysis, um, you know, what's working, what's not, uh, you need tools to measure the macro and the micro. And, and she brings up an excellent example of the micro. Thank you so much, Gwendolyn, and thank you, Attorney Josh. So we have one more question in the chat here, and I'm going to go ahead and read it. And I just invite everybody to feel free, if you have more questions or comments, feel free to use the chat um, to place your comments or questions. So this is from Anthony. 
what is the biggest argument you've heard for being against a database like this? That's the first question. And what has been the sentiment of the courts and our public safety departments towards this proposal? So what is the biggest argument you've heard for being against a database like this? And what has been the sentiment of the courts and our public safety departments towards this proposal? I can jump in. This is uh, Stacy Ledbetter. Um, as far as argument in that way and asking specifically, hi, Anthony. Um, thank you for this, first of all. The biggest argument, I haven't heard a quote unquote biggest argument. What we have to realize, and just when you think about um, the inception of quote unquote systems that has been going on um, you know, for decades and decades, is just um, things that hadn't been ha happening. And when you think about communities and whether they demand transparency and accountability or not. So sometimes just a shift to something be a, uh, different, there can be some hesitancy. And so that remains to be seen. So I don't wanna put anything on any of our systems. The attorney Hilgard mentioned our, um, you know, our three branches that operate in their own way and they should speak for themselves. We're doing this publicly. Everyone was invited, there's been coverage. And so again, as community members, we can all reach out and, and ask that. So each entity can speak uh, uh, for itself, if you will. And so as far as that sentiment that you put in here of the courts and public safety, uh, departments, you just see more of that in um, whether it be Kalamazoo County Commission or uh, City Commission and uh, the outliers, because there are numerous branches of government just in our county as a whole. And so again, when uh, public is on us, it's on community to start asking and eliciting those responses. And so again, just not wanting to put words in um, any miles as far as what we've been doing um, we've just been putting out the information. We, again, brought in the expert and compiling our own information and working together. So we're here standing before you with full expectation. There was a consensus before the vote, as we mentioned, with the county commissioners. And so we're actually looking forward, this, forward to this all falling into place when they vote on Wednesday. And for any who don't, because, again, we don't want to be presumptuous with that, during their time to make comment that they do that and give explanation as why as to why their uh, sentiment may be against it. So, I mean, yeah, sentiment may be against it uh, per your question. And so that's why it's important for us to not fall off even after this um, program, if you will, or event that we watch the uh, county commission meeting. If you're not able to, they're recorded. So you can always back go back to it, but we will be doing the best that we can to keep community informed as to whether uh, we were supported in this proceeding as we think it should. So hopefully that covers it, but the bottom line is I don't wanna speak for anybody else as community or collective community or individuals, let's just ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, Captain. So I'm gonna read this last comment from Commissioner Jen Strebs. And then again, I'm just going to invite you all to list any more comments or questions in the chat. And then after I read this, I'm going to hand this over to Rick. And thank you all for your awesome questions and comments and discussion. So Commissioner Strebs says, the system will say the resources are not available. Otherwise, there has been support in principle. The commission must be willing to commit resources to get it done, to get it done, and I knew things are coming in, as well as the participation of the other branches in participation. So true. Thank you so very much, Commissioner Strebs. All righty. So I am going to turn this over to Rick now. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Uh, my name is Rick Fryman with the Portage Anti-Racism Group called Portage Linking Our Voices. On behalf of the Campaign for Criminal Justice Transparency, we ask the Kalamazoo County Commission to please vote yes on this 
open database resolution at your meeting this Wednesday, November 3rd. The point of all this is to build trust. Trust between the community and the, com and the uh, criminal justice system. Uh, when if groups don't trust each other, it's, it's hard for them to work for the best outcomes. We want the best outcomes for our county. We want the county to move forward. And building trust is a, a really good thing to work for. So uh, transparency builds trust. So we need transparency to bolster trust in our criminal justice system. So commissioners, including my favorite commissioner, Mike Quinn, District 6, uh, District 10, my district. Commissioners, please vote yes on this resolution. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Rick. And right now I am going to hand this over to Ms. Wendy Fields and she's gonna read comments from our prosecutor. Ms. Wendy? Hello everyone, Wendy again. Uh, I received a statement from Prosecutor Getting uh, and he asked me to read it tonight uh, and I quote, as I have previously expressed to many people, including the board chair and vice chair, I support the office of the prosecuting attorney providing greater transparency. The office of the prosecutor attorney is already in the process of doing so. The board has recently provided the OPA with funding for an additional legal assistant to help us with doing it. Look to the examples provided by the Yave Pay County Attorney's Office and the Cook County State's Attorney for which I envision. I imagine that I will be needing further support from the board for additional resources as they are identified and look forward to their continued support. You should also know that I am involved in two national projects that are working with greater transparency and use of data in prosecution as a goal. The first is the National Prosecutorial Advisory Group on evaluating trust and legitimacy led by the Association of the Prosecuting Attorneys. The second is the Justice Courts Initiative organized by the Council of State Government. I point this out as examples of my commitment to this work. The proclamation that has been introduced by the Board of Commissioner goes miles beyond having the OPA provide greater transparency and the board providing funding for that. If the board wants to fund greater transparency, it can and should do so without going beyond the commitment to provide the necessary resources to the OPA to do so. I look forward to the board's continued financial support without overstepping their role so that my office can provide the type of information that the public wants. Again, my apologies for not being able to attend, but I have, uh, but I've, I have a prior commitment this evening. Jeff Getting, Kalamazoo County Prosecuting Attorney. Thank you. And I hand it over to Corey King. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to give a thank you all for um, this wonderful discussion. And uh, just give a reminder to everyone who hasn't already voted to vote in tomorrow's local elections. We have a lot of candidates and bond and milliches that are on the ballot tomorrow. And if you haven't voted or if you haven't voted already, you can go to your local township or city clerk's office to register to vote and vote there at the office. Thank you so very much, Corey. And so we just ask you all to go ahead and look in your chat. Um, lots of great resources, email addresses, um, information about tuning into the Zoom meeting on Wednesday. We just encourage you all, be beloved community members, to stay keep staying involved and letting your voice be heard and we want to thank you all so very much for joining us tonight and we look forward to being on zoom together on wednesday so thank you thank you you all